TiO2. However, TiO2 is not a conductor, and there are no electrons around that could actually do that. So what's the problem, and how does, can we resolve that? And I'll show you in the next 10 minutes how we looked at this. First of all, as I said, I'm an experimentalist. I have a, a deep belief in theory, but the belief, the depth has a certain finite length. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to see if they make a prediction, is it true? So my postdoc, Martin Sterra, did an experiment. He formed three MGO layers on, uh, on uh, silver and eight MGO layers on silver and put gold on it. And if you do, and if you look at these things with an, a scanning talent microscope, you see that for three layers, it's flat. For eight layers, it's three-dimensional. You can see it here by the tracers that you, that you measure. Very clearly, there's a transition from a raft situation to a, a balling up situation. And <clears throat> that probably has to do with the electrons that tunnel from the interface to the gold. That's not a new idea. It's something that you have to realize there's not much new under the sun. You come up with something you think is new, and you look back, it has already been said, most of the time. Uh, what happens here is <clears throat> something that um, Sir Neville Mott knew the idea, he used to explain uh, oxide film growth in the tarnishing of metals. The same phenomenon, electron tunneling through the film. Now, why would a three monolayer film be different from an eight monolayer film? Well, the tunneling length is different, but that's not all of it. There is one important part to it. Thin oxides, when you put them on metal, have a completely different phonon spectrum than a thick oxide film, and, I, and that changes from thin to thick within five monolayers. A thin oxide film has a soft phonon spectrum. A thick oxide film has a very um, uh, hard phonon spectrum. And that leads to the fact that once you have transferred an electron, the electron distorts the oxide. It, forms a, it, it, it introduces a polaronic distortion, and that polaronic distortion creates the grade for the electron. That's why the electron stays on the, on the gold. When you go to an eight mole layer film, there's still electrons tunneling, but there's the same probability to tunnel back, and there's no reason for the electron to stay there. So that's why very, very thin oxide films have this particular property. Um, when we came up with this uh, idea together with Gianfranco Pacchioni, um, uh, I thought that was not studied. If you look back 10 years before, Mario Rocca in Genoa had already done the yields. So uh, he knew that that phenomenon exists, but he couldn't make the connection, of course, to, to this. So uh, there is this. And now we can look at the gold particles or the gold pancake cakes in detail. And this is an exercise for elementary physical chemistry or quantum mechanics. It's actually uh, a pancake of gold. It has six S electrons of each gold atom in it. And it forms a sea of gold electrons. And this uh, sea of gold electrons behaves like a particle in a pancake. That's like a particle in a box. And so when you put a particle into a box, you know that there, is, there are, there are uh, standing waves formed in the box, and they have nodal structures. A pancake has a specific nodal structure. And Hanu Hekinen, who is a physicist from Finland, who did that analysis, used not a particle in a box, but he used a parabolic potential. And if you put electrons into that parabolic potential, you will see the ground state has no node. It's an S function. He calls it an S function. The second one is a P function, has one node. The, the next higher one is a D function, has, has more nodes. And so it goes up to F and G. And so you have nodes. And if you can see the nodes in the pancake, you can start to count electrons. You know exactly how many electrons are in that pancake. Right? So if you do this, <coughs> you use the SDM as a spectrometer. Uh, here is the occupied states of the pancake, and here is the unoccupied states of the pancake. And if you put your spectrometer at that energy here, and you put it in the right place, these are two places, and you see that the greenish curve is recorded here, sorry, he here, and the uh, bluish curve is uh, recorded here. And that has to do with the electron distribution, which you see here. This is a, a conduction map that represents the electron distribution in that particular state. And you can see it has a node here. So if you put your tip here, you can't record a current because there is no wave function, no electron density, okay? So <clears throat> if you go through the various states, you can determine the structure of uh, the electronic structure of this pancake. 
And you can in particular see what the highest occupied orbital, if you want, is, and what the lowest occupied orbital is. And if you count, there are four nodes. Whoops. If you go back and you, you see um, one, zero node, one node, two node, three, two, three nodes, four nodes, nodal planes, it's a G orbital, so you know how many electrons are in there. And this is a gold 18, four minus particle. So we, we know what the electronic structure is. We can relate the size to the, the, the number of atoms and to the number of electrons. <clears throat> now, this is a gold 18 cluster. That's a relatively small cluster. And the question is, can you do it for any other? Yes, you can. These are some uh, particular examples where we've done the same thing. And we've actually gone from one atom all the way to 20 atoms. Now, the question is, what happens when you make the particle a little larger? What happens then is that the nodal structure no longer plays a very important role. There is still, of course, this uh, distribution of electrons, but the rim of the cluster, that is the oxide metal interface, becomes particularly important because when you have you extend the particle, you go away from a molecule to forming a metal, the electrons want to go away from each other as far as possible. And the way to do this is to go to the rim. And in fact, they localize in particular parts of the rim, you can almost already guess it here. This is a, a, a cluster here, this is single gold atom. They sit in particular places. If you do current maps, you can actually localize these sites and this, the model that is imposed on it was done by Hanwha again. They are mainly localized at kinks. So there is this particle and it has all these electrons sitting at the rim. And what I will show you is first of all, what, what that has to do with the electronic structure and then what, it, what that has to do with chemical reactivity. So what I will show you in the middle of my talk uh, is that we can actually visualize, see the reaction of molecules at the rim of this cluster, something that we always wanted to do. And we only achieved that in the last three months. And I thought I'd, I'd share that with you. However, <clears throat> before I show you that, I want to make a point. Because you would say, well, these thin oxide films have nothing to do with reality, right? The point is, you only, the only thing you need is an electron source in your material. And we all know, and the semiconductor industry uses it for the last 30, 40 years. <clears throat> all you need to do is you need to dope the material. If you have an electron source by doping, these dopants can transfer electrons. So if we make the film thicker so it represents the bulk material uh, and we put an appropriate dope in it, we should be able to do the same thing on a bulk material that we have done on a thin film. And here is an example. This is um, calcium oxide now. This is 60 monolayers. So it's basically representing the bulk. Very difficult to do scanning tunneling microscopy with it. You can only inject electrons from the top. It's very difficult to get atomic resolution, although you can work on it. And here comes the important phenomenon. If you have the naked calcium oxide, you put gold on it, lo and behold, it's a three-dimensional particle. That's what you expect. You put less than 1% molybdenum into the calcium oxide. The molybdenum uh, uh, sits in the host where the calcium, uh, the calcium ions sit. Calcium oxide, as you all know, is rock salt. Molybdenum mol mol sits in the calcium sites, but it can change oxidation state. And it costs less to, call, to make uh, molybdenum oxide and transfer that molybdenum, uh, uh, positively charged molybdenum, and transfer the electron, then keeping the electron there once there is something as an electron trapped at the surface. And so if you put the molybdenum in, the gold all goes pancake. The same phenomenon that I showed you on the thin film. And we can tell that it's pancake because you see a more ray pattern. We can even determine the structure of these gold particles by looking at the more ray structure. Here you can see a close to atomic resolution image of a, um, of a gold uh, particle uh, on a calcium oxide that is a thick material. So we, we believe, and that's not publishing, so we believe that we can actually um, see exactly the same phenomenon on bulk materials that we see on the thin film. And what Wayne had was the TiO2, when you look at the crystal, it's blue or black. And that means there is so much interstitials and they do nothing but the same that a dopant does. So that's the reason. So we understand, we believe, what the rafting situation is. Now, can we do something about chemistry? 